Hello everyone and welcome to the podcast in the framework of the EU mentorship program supported by the European Liberal Forum. Today we have an opportunity to discuss about the developments in the eastern flank of Europe, more precisely what is happening in Ukraine, Georgia, the situation with Russia, perspectives for European integration of that part of Europe. Together with us we have Dr. Maria Alessina, who is project officer in the European Liberal Forum from uh, Ukraine herself. And also with us is George Mons, really the chairman of the European Georgia Institute from the Republic of Georgia. Welcome to both, both of you. Uh, without further ado, uh, can you tell us what are the latest developments in the eastern flank of Europe? We know, Maria, that everybody, everybody talks about war in Ukraine, but uh, how would you describe the current situation? The current situation is considered uh, to be quite difficult uh, because currently under some estimations uh, approximately 20% of the territory uh, in the uh, east of the country is uh, temporarily occupied by Russians and uh, well, shall I speak about how do we win? It's important for I think for all of our viewers who are following this, this uh, video cast to understand not only what, the, what we see in the news but what are the developments on the ground, how do people feel what are they actually confronting with on a daily basis? Uh, you mean, uh, majority or uh, how does life go on in Ukraine? Uh, it depends on the on the on the part of Ukraine, of course. But uh, some people consider think that maybe Ukraine is in, in in the capital or in the rest of the country uh, now life is back to normal, which is of course not not the case, not the truth. Because first of all, everyone is here in the air silence all day long and. It's, uh, everyone is in danger, not, no place in Ukraine is currently safe. Uh, at the same time, of course, people are trying to come back to ordinary life as much as possible because we, we need to keep the economy going. This is something, uh, this is the way how people see them supporting the country now. They, they have to work, they have to support the army, but also they have to do their own job. Uh, in, the, in the east of the country where the conflict is uh, in, the, in its heatest, uh, Points now it's uh, of course completely different, much more intense, and uh, for the army, uh, everyone is very tired on both sides, uh, and it shows in the conflict that uh, now it's a very exhausting stage of the conflict. We're waiting for many more weapons to come, but of course now psychological and physical war time, but no one is going to to give up the fight. Uh, it, it will last as long as we need. Uh, for people who are uh, living in the who were not able or not willing to leave the occupied territories, uh, it's very difficult because um, it depends from one city to another one, but uh, uh, when Russians come they try to impose their own uh, their own uh, way of doing things, which is completely different from Ukraine and uh, uh, those who didn't leave now they're trying to even if it's considered to be too late, they're trying to leave because it's uh, many many people say it's just impossible to So this is kind of a life under constant trauma and possibility to be attacked by a Russian missile at any moment at any place in the country and tragic horror uh, stories of uh, military clashes on the front lines in the, in the various of the country. Um, you were saying when we were talking to each other earlier that Ukraine was never as united as it is now. How is that unity being uh, seen, portrayed actually? What does it mean? Uh, indeed, this is, uh, this is the truth. This is something which everyone uh, acknowledges that uh, the country has never been more united and more uh, determined to, uh, to fight until we, until we win. This is uh, something which uh, everyone is 100% uh, is certain about that we will fight it, uh, until we win. Uh, we will not uh, give up, we will not uh, agree on the on the conditions which are which we uh, which we don't want to agree, and so we'll, we'll, we'll fight on all the fronts. And this is the the, the, the unity on people is that we have to fight on all the fronts, economic front as much as we can, militarily, of course, for sure, diplomatically, uh, on all possible levels. In everyone in his or her field, uh, we have to fight for the future of Ukraine. This is something which we, 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 now we fight not only for against Russia in this current war, we, we fight for the place of Ukraine in the world, in Europe, for, for the case to come. And this is something which everyone understands. This is uh, the most strategic of um, 
the most tragical moment in our history, of course, but at the same time, it's a chance for us to, to define how we see our future and to, to, to decide together that's where we want to be in 20 years or 30 years and we move now there, even if it's difficult, even if it takes a lot of time and effort, everyone in the country knows that all these victims, they shouldn't be affected. So the, uh, the Russian invasion united Ukrainians in belief of their country, in the determination to preserve the Ukrainian identity and the statehood. Um, Ukraine was not the first victim of the Russian expansionism. Uh, Georgia was the first victim actually with, with the occupation of Abkhazia uh, in the very uh, west uh, of, the, of your country. Later on in 2008, further invasion by the Russian troops to Georgia with the occupation of South Ossetia. Uh, how is this later ex military expansionism of Putin's Russia being seen in Georgia this day, Georgia? Well, I mean, thank you very much for the invitation. First of all, I'd like to express my sympathy with the people of Ukraine who right now are defending their country. And as you have correctly assumed, we, Georgia, know better than anyone what a Russian invasion actually means. Our struggle with Russia began not in 2008, as many people in Europe often consider, but much earlier, since Georgia declared its independence. We felt all the evils of Russia's malign influences. Originally, <clears throat> it was the influence of propaganda. It, we had lots of attempts to portray the first Georgian government as Nazis. As you know, the same strategies today being used against the Ukrainian government, absolutely unfair, absolutely unbased. Um, and we were left alone. There is a very strong feeling among Georgians that in 1990, and also in 2008, the reaction in the West was not enough, and if this reaction had been more coherent, more reasonable, more feasible, in this case, most probably, neither 2014, Russia's occupation of Crimea, nor the current situation would have happened. So we do know very well that Russian invasion means. The region of Abkhazia, which was a war zone even before Putin, was an excellent example that Russian toolkit does not change. That they are using the same tactics, same strategies against their neighbors, and that Russian imperialism is well alive, and it was alive even after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Even worse, when the Soviet Union dissolved, we are witnessing new Russian ideology, new Russian ideology based on imperialism. And even though there are some people who argue that Yeltsin's government was different, that he was trying to build some, you know, new Russia, democratic Russia, obviously it is not true. The situation in Moldova, the Francisco region, the wars in Georgia, Lutina Plaza, and Sivan region is a very clear illustration that Russia does not want to change. So the only reason why the Soviet Union actually dissolved was uh, the, the Cold War, that was the Cold War and the way how it ended with the collapse of the Soviet Union. As soon as Russia got enough resources, we were witnessing that they continued their attempts to subjugate, subdue, and enslave all their neighbors. We heard this chilling statement from the Russian president a few days ago when he was referring to the to the great in that time that actually the imperialism that we have witnessed, this brutal imperialism that you refer to towards the neighbors, was not actually nothing wrong, but it was just assuming what was historically Russian. Does that uh, set a chill factor in Georgia when you were listening to this kind of message coming from the Kremlin? You mentioned a very important topic for both our region and also for Russia, the weaponization of history. The regime in Russia is using history as a weapon. This weapon is very able to attract people in many regions. For example, in Georgia, Russia has a very different narrative. According to Russian historians, when the Russian Empire conquered Georgian kingdoms, they actually saved the Christians from Elysium. And this narrative is being continued up until now. In case of comparisons with Peter the Great, with the previous comparison with uh, Ned Wolliner and others, all of it is a part of propaganda or mission. All of it is an attempt to make a text of neighbors in the 21st century a normal situation, which it is not. 
It is all attempts to demonstrate, and also it is a very clear message to Sweden and Finland, because two countries have decided to join NATO now, because the Peter is great was fighting Swedes. The main battles of that king were attempts to breach and make a window to Europe. This narrative is often quite strong in Russia. Nowadays, we are interesting that Putin is not opening the window to Europe, but he has closed it for many more years. So, <clears throat> to get back to your question, we, of course, are not chill. Of course, we realize that 20% of Georgian territory is occupied. Georgia, unfortunately, does not have the strategic depth, as we call it, to be able to defend ourselves in case of a full-scale Russian invasion. Russian tanks are located in 60 kilometers from the capital city, from capital Tbilisi, and eventually our armed forces, of course, will do their best to defend ourselves, but it will be a very unfair fight in any case. That's why we are always noticing that Europe's actions to recreate security architecture, both in Europe, in the continental Europe, and also in a broader sense, as a Western region, which has which has crucial importance for the security of the entire world, they were not enough, and they are not enough even now. When we're talking about our Ukrainian counterparts, we're also always hearing that there are lots of problems with weapons delivery, with diplomatic support, and so on and so on. Right, let me go back to what you have said, the weaponization of history, or misinterpretation of history that we have seen coming from the Kremlin, Kremlin these days. Uh, in terms of fueling up propaganda uh, and how the historical uh, events are being misinterpreted in order to give leg legitimacy to this in in imperialist expansionism of, uh, of, of Russia. Um, these events of uh, Russians, Russians saving the Christian neighbors uh, were based on the way the Kremlin wanted to see the things. But we see nowadays a democratic unity of the population in countries like Ukraine and Georgia where over 80% of the people democratically want to be part of the European structures, which is predominantly the European Union. We are now a few uh, short weeks ahead of the Council of the European Union, where both Ukraine and Georgia, uh, alongside with Moldova, are expecting a signal from the European uh, Union about the possible candidate status. Maria, is this really important for, for your country? I couldn't emphasize how important it is because um, getting uh, being granted the candidate status is something which uh, in Ukraine will be seen as a, the support with the European Union. Is expected to give us because we uh, we've been fighting for this uh, at least in the revolution uh, on Europe Maidan. The entire revolution was actually a further signal to the European Union. We're fighting to be with you. We're ready to do what it takes. People are ready to do what it takes. And uh, since then, we've been we've had a war as a result, as an outcome of that uh, regime change. Uh, Directly, directly, but still, since the Euromaidan, Ukraine is uh, in a state of war for European values, uh, directly, uh, very openly, very straightforwardly, and uh, now in this full fledged war, of course, uh, being granted at least a candidate status, it's something which uh, for sure the entire country expects, um, hopes for, uh, but also expects, not only hopes for, and I think if we are not being granted this uh, status, it will be perceived as a um, uh, as a sign, we don't want you in the club, uh, which is a very, uh, the first reaction would be very, a lot of pain, I think, because, because people really uh, invested a lot of uh, efforts in uh, proving to Europe that we want to be, we're ready to be, and we're worth of being uh, part of the club. But at the same time, uh, the next reaction will be okay, then we have to decide for ourselves how we will, uh, what will be our future if Europe doesn't want us. Not even now, and even in these circumstances, if we don't get it now, for sure we won't get it later. You know, this is already the, what else can we do? The, it just doesn't depend on us in this case. We did what we could, and then we have to decide uh, how we will live in the future. And then, of course, this resentment, which uh, uh, which would be uh, the outcome of 
hopefully not, but if, in case uh, we, we do not receive this uh, positive uh, decision, it will be a very, uh, it will be difficult to restore things. So. Remind, remind us something, uh, your parliament was elected with, uh, in a democratic process mm -hmm. through a legitimate uh, ele electoral uh, uh, victory mm -hmm. with huge majority of, of, uh, of, the, of the government. Mm -hmm. And uh, that led towards constitutional changes which prescribe the membership of the European yes. Union as a constitutional yes. obligation of your government. Yes. Has the European Union at that time when you changed the constitution reacted saying this is a wishful thinking or was, were you encouraged by the European Union to go in this direction? I think uh, all the signals which we received from the European, uh, European Union, at least until the war began, uh, the full fledged war, uh, they were rather. Uh, How to say? How to put it? Uh, Mixed, they were, encouraging. Uh, they, were, uh, they were not. Maybe they were very reserved. Extremely reserved. Okay. Yes. We are happy that you are willing. We acknowledge your willingness, but we do not uh, take any commitments on our side. The door is open, which can mean many things, and uh, the door is being open. Uh, but uh, uh, at the same time, uh, it has never been. Uh, no major steps have been taken by the European Union to. Uh, we made a step towards the EU, they didn't really make an equal step towards us. And uh, again, for a certain period of time, Ukraine uh, was ready to uh, to see itself as okay, we have to, we're an aspiring country, we have to do what it takes to get there to prove that we, are, we can get there eventually. But uh, with this situation now, we pride that we pay for European values, which are really European values. Which is 100% our own choice. We do, we do not do, do it only for the EU, we do it for ourselves, first of all. But we, I think also with Volodymyr Zelensky's position, who said in front of the European Parliament uh, after a week after the war began that we want to be equal among equals and we wanted to be treated as equals, and now we really expect something from the EU as well. Now we're really, I think, we surpassed the stage when we are uh, hesitating if. Uh, whether it will be, we want to be treated as, as an equal. You know, we see on the military field that the Europeans are extending support to Russia, but there is this reluctance on the political level whether there a step should be taken. And George, Lisbon Treaty. The Lisbon Treaty is the guiding principle for the function of the European Union, which actually provides an opportunity for every European country which wants so to aspire for membership in the European Union. And yet there is this reluctance. What do you expect to happen now at the Council of the, of the European Union on the 23rd, 24th of June? Do you expect a new reluctance which will empower Kremlin even more? Or do you expect the European Union to actually stand up to what it had committed in the past to, to do? To offer perspective to every country that aspires to this? It's a very, you know, it's a one million dollar question. Because I wish we had to offer, but uh... but unfortunately, well, I want to believe. I think it will be the right holding that the European Union will be able to learn from the mistakes of the past. For example, the mistakes of the Bucharest summit of NATO, when Georgia and Ukraine were promised that one day both countries will become NATO members, but this promise was not followed by any of the human steps, like granting membership action plan or anything else. We all perfectly well know how it ended in 2008. Russia considered that it was losing those countries and it started a full scale invasion in Georgia. Both regions were occupied, um, and the attempt to dissolve the Georgia government, uh, luckily for us, was not successful. However, this mistake largely empowered Russia because the Russians realized that they would not be stopped. Europeans were not willing to defend those two countries. And eventually, the Russian regime considered that Europeans might be talking as much as they want, but they're not ready to take any coherent specific action. It was a very bad signal to Russia, a signal that it accepted, and a signal that it decided to act upon. So you hope that that has changed now? I do hope so. I want to hope that. And eventually, the expectation is probably that both, all the three countries should be equally treated. All the three countries should be evaluated based on their merit and also on the current geopolitical imperative situation. 
The situation right now demonstrates that the European Union also has to transform and to become a more coherent decision maker. That's what we have to do. Your sense, because you're from the Europe Georgia Institute, you, you, you know, you understand how the European Union acts, behaves, how it takes positions. How would you explain a possible negative decision by the European Union? Would there be any logic for that? There would be no logic speaking in political terms, or geopolitical, or even strategic terms for the future of the EU. However, we always need to consider that there might be local actors and local politics involved, combined with influences from Russian Federation that are unfortunately very strong in some of the European capitals. These influences might be stronger than the struggle of Ukrainian people, than the struggle of Georgians, but I do hope that the European Union shall be able to make the right decision that will be vital for the future of Europe. European Union, uh, there is this question, you know, the famous American question, where if you, if you want to talk to the European Union, who do you dial? It's, do you dial one number? Or do you dial some of the people who are leading the Council, Commission, Parliament? Do you dial 27 countries? As a researcher, uh, I mean, you have a PhD. Maria, what can we expect from the European Union, not only now, but in the future, vis-a-vis -vis its policy towards the, its, its perspective neighbors? That's all, uh, not only Western Balkans, but uh, the countries like Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. Its perspective members, what do we expect uh, from the European Union, and what do we recommend to the European Union in the, in the months and the years to come? This is a very interesting question and the one which uh, which is preoccupying us all uh, in this last month and and for me it's uh, I'm a bit torn between the two sides because I'm uh, I'm Ukrainian myself I'm on the Ukrainian side 100% at the same time uh, of course it was European politics and I understand from European perspective as well their own concerns and and we are assured you, Ukrainians understand the world. Ukrainians understand very well what are the European reservations and concerns and internal things. We all know the European Union is a complex construction with many interests, with many different, uh, with their own um, concerns now which are unrelated to, to what we are going through. Uh, what we can expect, uh, I think it's one of these historical moments when it's difficult to predict because again, many factors and sometimes we expect one thing, something else happens, but uh, what we what we can advise the European Union and what we what we should expect, I think, and what we can almost demand from the European Union at this point is really to think long term, to think strategically, and to think um, to think as to think as a whole, to say, think as a whole, because uh, uh, there are many interests which are divergent within the European Union, but if we look at the global scale. Uh, our interests are very close to each other. And I think sometimes that's what, what happened to Ukraine. Having this external enemy, this external opponent, uh, it's very useful to, to unite the country inside. And the same goes for the European Union as well. It's very it's very easy to be to, to see how different we all are. But at the same time, if you find someone who's externally uh, presenting a threat to all of us, it's very easy to find our ground and to think, okay, what is what is our common interest? Because for sure now uh, the world is, is is very is very global. We cannot think locally anymore, and I think no one can afford thinking locally. So um, who do we dial? It's uh, it's a good question, and uh, Europe. I think European Union leaders we cannot substitute them with the national leaders. The national leaders. There are also European Union leaders, and they all have to work together, and somehow the common interest should prevail. Because if it's a national interest, we are also. So, maybe this is the higher discussion that came out from the framework of the conference on the future of Europe, which actually recommended the ways how the European Union should be transformed in the way it operates, in the way it functions, in order to be more uh, able to react to the situations in the world, to these external threats to the European way of life, to the freedom of expression, to what we consider in Europe for granted like uh, freedom to be who we are, uh, to enjoy our liberties, to travel everywhere, not to have orders among ourselves, and not to list all the benefits that come with, from the European Union. These are all being threatened by external factors. Can Georgia survive outside of the European uh, Union mechanism, Georgia? Um, 
I believe that the future of Georgia is European, and to be honest, I do not see any development in which the future of my country that I dearly love is not connected to the European Union. Um, it's not only about security, it's also about the ideas and ideals and the way of life that Georgians both have and want to have. Georgia is a very European country at its core, and all the polls or all the research clearly indicates this. So obviously, the only way to survive, if you wish, or to save the way of life we have for Georgia is to deepen European integration, but at the same time, we should not perceive it as a, only one way road. Georgia also has a lot to offer. For example, Georgia has a unique geostrategic position, which is crucial if the European Union wants to become a world actor. Georgia is the gateway to the Central Asia region, which is very rich in its nature of gas and other resources. And also, again, Georgia has extreme importance for the security of the entire Black Sea region, especially right now when we're witnessing that Russian forces are controlling not only the Sea of Azov in Ukraine, not only Crimea, but also the port of Herzog. So, in this case, Georgia's relationship with the EU, Georgia's willingness to join the club, it's not only a one way road. So, this is very important to understand. It's not only about demanding to be part of the club, but offering something to the club. So, uh, we heard from Georgia, what can Georgia uh, offer? to the European Union as a member. What can you bring up to the EU as, as, a, as a potential member? I think actually, uh, again, uh, what you've uh, been uh, saying before, that like, for a long time Ukraine themselves thought that we are looking up to Europe, but now I think actually we have a lot to offer to Europe as well, in terms of our people, our dedication to European way of life, to European values, our readiness to fight for them, our creativity, our innovativeness, our land, our position, Geographically, so all the things actually now that uh, when this war with Russian aggression started by Russian aggression, when it uh, turned the world into indeed it put all the questions on the global scale, for me it's very difficult to see Europe without Ukraine, to be honest. I, I think the border of Europe really shifted to the border of Ukraine. So, you are actually saying that if this debate, which is currently taking place in the heart of the European politics, about self-sustaining European Union, about autonomous European Union, about the autonomous defense, or a reliance on food supplies. Actually, answer to that is integrating Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, and of course Western Balkans. Only then Europe can achieve these goals. Only in this case, European Union can consider itself as a whole entity. Without these, without Western Balkans, without the Caucasus, without Ukraine, it is impossible to consider the European project as a complete one. And also, if we're talking about self-sustainability, autonomous, and so on, of course there is a necessity to finish the project and then to start transforming the project from the inside. It's not finished, and I like the expressions of our colleagues beyond the ocean have, to build a better union. That's a job that has to be done. Thank you very much, and I hope that everybody who watched this podcast will understand the message. We need unity, we need to uh, think together how to bring this unity about not only of the current 27, but also those who are aspiring, offer a helping hand, and make sure that Europe is prosperous and built, as you said, every weekend. Thank you very much, and I hope you will enjoy the other uh, editions of the video cast. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>